Good morning. It's my privilege to lead us in a continued study in the book of Acts, the history of the early church inspired of God through the writer Luke. And if you'll turn there, I would appreciate it. I remind you that we, as Paul has uh, declared and, and we have studied about recently in this same text, that through many tribulations, one must enter the kingdom. I like that word hassles, through a lot of hassles in life, uh, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, the Apostle Paul is about to, in fact, we're today into that second missionary journey, and when he was about to begin that second missionary journey, he had difficulties in getting started, and he sought to choose his team carefully. And he set out on this second journey, and immediately God was opening and shutting certain doors for him. And that's the way our life is. We start down in a certain journey. We think we're going, you know, James talks about that, to, about to, you don't take anything for granted. It's if the Lord wills, we start out a certain way, and God changes our direction for us. Paul is following the Great Commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's why we're here. We have been touched by, the, that have been touched by His grace, are to be about His business of finding His sheep. That's why I, what I call this, and by the way, there's Sheep in scripture, as you know, and sheep in reality are just dumb animals, very stupid. And that's what we are, is a bunch of dumb animals following the great shepherd. But thank God we have the great shepherd. Now, we're going to a suffering and dying world. Almost everybody here has gone through a bunch of stuff already in their life. Don't want to bring tears to our eyes, but I know if most recently we had the loss of our dear sister Pam, secretary here for so many years, given up to cancer. Well, we know where she is today. She's in the presence of Almighty God, but we still miss her. And all of this has to do with while we have time, let's serve God. Let's be faithful. That's what Paul is doing. He's redeeming the time here. Serving God. Well, if you're in chapter 16, and we'll be uh, moving on today uh, from chapter 11, uh, verse 11, trying to get through verse 15 about Lydia. And let me ask you to bow with me again in prayer as I ask God to help me and help you as we study together because we are in the precious Word of God. Father, we desire this morning to know you and to know Christ Jesus and for others to know you and to know Christ Jesus and to be comforted and blessed from such a relationship. Oh, press upon us by your Holy Spirit, I pray thee. Reveal to us your truth and your glory and help us to see what is really important here today as we study together and glorify the name of Jesus Christ. I ask this in His precious name. Amen. Well, now that I've told you to turn to Acts 16, turn to, keep your finger there, and turn to Luke chapter 15 as we really deal with what is God doing in the world. And in this context, these self-righteous Pharisees, religious people, but people that really did not know God, but they were religious, and looked down their nose at others, addressed the Lord Jesus, why do you go to sinners? Why do you eat with sinners? Why do you associate yourself with people like that? Look at chapter Luke 15, verse 1. Now, all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to him, that is to Jesus, 
to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes begin to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which is lost until he finds him, finds it? And when he's found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. He lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. What is God doing? Well, he's, like, he's doing a lot of things, yes. But ultimately, what he is really doing in history, he is directing things in history and particularly working through his church, the extension of Christ's ministry on the earth, that's what we are here for, to bring lost sheep to Jesus Christ, to bring them to God, to give them salvation and hope, true hope, that only God can give. That's why we're meeting today. We are here today to be built up in the most holy faith, yes, that we might be equipped to go out and preach the word, to show the love of God to others. And by His doing, and it has to be His doing, bring in His lost sheep. Look uh, further, since we're already keeping your finger back in Acts, look at John 10. John 10, beginning in verse 14. What does Jesus say? I am the good shepherd. There he is again. And I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And notice here, I have other sheep which are not of this fold, that fold that he was immediately talking to that knew him. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. And we hear his voice today in the precious word of God. He said that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He is that word. If you look across the page there, at verse 26, if you're still in John 10, what does he say? He's talking to, the, again, these self-righteous ones who would not believe in him. You do not believe because you are not of my sheep. You're not one of my sheep. My sheep, he says, hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. There's nothing better than that. I don't care what's going on. There's nothing better than that. So what is God doing? He's sending out His Word through faithful individuals, even today, and calling His sheep, His elect, to Himself. In fact, if we think about 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9, we are really told there, when a, a, in a careful study, why hasn't Christ returned since his first coming, that is, returned because he has promised to do so and to establish his kingdom on the earth. It's because he's not willing that any should perish. And a thousand years are like one day, and one day is like a thousand years, and he hasn't returned because the last one of his sheep has not been called to himself. And so what we're studying today in the book of Acts is the continuation of Paul's efforts to do God's will by bringing the gospel of Jesus Christ to God's sheep. Sheep that hadn't heard the word yet, but when they do, they will turn to him. And he is in the initiation stage, moving by faith into a larger circle, going further and further out 
from his base being led by the Spirit of God. And we've already seen that. And so here is this short account with, that we're going to look at today with many elements about evangelism and missions and what's important. And it's a lesson for us, not just to look at it and say, my, isn't that nice, but how does that apply to me? And so we move in our narrative, now flipping back over to Acts chapter 16 and verse 11. We move in our narrative thinking of what we're looking at here is at a very high level. Uh, we're not getting all the details. We're just kind of giving a broad stroke at this of what's important, all under inspiration but we should keep in mind that these men are doing what is near impossible in that day and time of stretching themselves out into strange territory with different sorts of people all to go into all the, or the world and preach the gospel. And so beginning in verse 11, we read, So putting out to sea from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and on the day following to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia. Why don't you throw that map back up back there, brother, on the screen so that uh, folks can see that, and re may I remind you of that. Now, that red line, and I know that's probably hard unless you got on your trifocals for you to, and to see that on the screen. But if you look way over there to the right, uh, the, where Paul began his journey, and he's going all through Asia there, and now he's moving across that uh, Aegean Sea into Macedonia, and he's going to end up there at Philippi. He's a long way from home for a guy on foot or a guy going in water in this rickety, these rickety boats that they had at that time with sails on it, and everything was a dangerous, difficult thing. And so when we get to verse 11, it says, So putting out to sea from Troas, so there is the same word in the, in the Greek that would be, could be translated therefore, and it shows the immediate non-hesitating response of Paul from his apostolic vision that God gave him back at Troas when they were there as to where God wanted him to go into Macedonia. Now his group now includes Silas and he added Timothy at Lystra as we studied last time and Luke and he says we ran a straight course which means really in, in a close study that he sailed before the wind. God was moving them along according to divine appointment. And this journey by water from Troas was 150 miles back to land at Samothrace, an island, and then to Neapolis, which is really the port, the extended port of Philippi. And so then they had to walk 10 miles by foot to Philippi. And so we get to verse 12. Verse 12. It says, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony, and we're staying in this city for some days. Now we're given some detail in a broad sense. They were, it says, this is a leading city. It's a prominent city in Macedonia. And most importantly now, what does this mean? It means they are now in Europe for the first time. And it's called here a Roman colony, and Roman has been added by the translators because it just really calls it a colony. But it is a Roman colony, meaning it was designed to be a mini Rome. What did Rome do in its imperialism? They went out and their government formed major places, major cities, and they did just little mini Romans, mini Romes, if you want to call it that. And, and they indoctrinated those places and ruled with a heavy hand in those places over the people that were there. It was designed to be a mini Rome, and it was in this manner that Rome protected itself from every form of insurrection. Now, this second journey we should be able to clearly see 
is graphically moving by the sovereign God. No accidents here. This little band of really misfits, and that really fits all of God's people to one degree or another. If you don't see yourself as a misfit today, then, well, you crumps. I'm sorry. You need to look in the mirror or whatever you need to do <laughs> to understand. And, uh, and it, this little band is moving providentially. They are God's sheep, these dumb animals, but they are receptive to the message of Christ. And they are precious to God. And they are out there seeking others that would be receptive to the message of Christ. And it says we were staying in this city for some time. They were convinced it was God's will to be in this location. And from Paul's apostolic vision, they believe this is where God would have them focus for a time. And so that's where they are. And so implied by other Pauline texts as well is the fact that with them seeking lost sheep in this place, Paul says elsewhere, pray at all times. Pray without ceasing. I couldn't tell you the number of times that he repeats in the New Testament the essential of prayer. Why aren't lost sheep coming more often and showing their face? Why aren't we reaching lost sheep as we ought to be in some cases? Pray, pray, pray. Do I need to say it again? Pray. This is not your work. It's not my work. It's not our cunning. It's God's work. Pray, pray. Verse 13 we read, And on the Sabbath day we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. Wow. Sabbath day, Saturday. And of course, we're talking here about a Jewish day, a Jewish day of rest and that had become a Jewish day of, of worship and reflection, and then that city... Uh, the outside the gate would be away from the city where perhaps inside, because it was a Roman colony, there were unlawful gatherings that could possibly take place in, in the name of some deity that wasn't uh, acceptable to Rome. Or perhaps if nothing else, it would be awkward, but it was also a place that they went when you didn't have a synagogue to go to. There's a lot of things in the scripture about water. Think of Christ at the, with the woman at the well in John 4. Living water. Think of Naaman in the Old Testament and how he had leprosy and he was cleansed by God with water. Think of the, the, the relationship of salvation to the cleansing. We think of Ezekiel 36, 26, a washing the cleansing that must take place. Or in Titus chapter 3, the washing of regeneration. There is much about water. Revelation chapter 22, and the new Jerusalem, and the new heavens and earth. There's a river that flows from the throne of God. Water. But this isn't just water. This is God's water. This is Water represents and symbolizes life, and it's special. that We can't live without it. Think of, uh, I thought of Psalm 137. Flip back over there just for a moment with me. Psalm 137. This is a psalm where there's a bunch that have been taken hostage, carried off to Babylon, but their heart and all their difficulty is still trusting in God. And what does it say here? By the rivers of Babylon... There they are in Babylon. They don't want to be there. There we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. You can feel that, can't you? I can. Oh, you got troubles. Yeah. Well, that water represented something to them out in the open there of the preciousness of what God does in refreshing His people and cleansing them from their sins. 
And they sat down by that river. Someday we ought to do that. We ought to just meet as a church. We will find us a river somewhere. Around here, it's hard to do one that's flowing, but uh, you have to go to the San Antonio River, I guess. But here they are by that river. And because Paul recognized that there may be some true worshipers of God or some worshipers that were seeking God at least, they may be out by a river. And that's where they go. And so here we have, then we the, get to the blessing of the God directing Paul to Philippi and why he is there when we look at verse 14. And it says, A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. They start talking to these women that are there by this river and one of these women in particular, we don't know who else, but we know for sure that this one woman, her ears are not just vibrating with those little pieces in there because of noise, but she was listening and the idea behind that is it was making a difference in her. She was listening to what was really going on, what was really being said. And it says, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. Well, we get a description of this lady. And uh, here's someone unexpected. She's, it says that she's a seller of purple fabrics. Other writings tell us that purple was the color for royalty. And so here she is, a businesswoman. And we will see from her residence later that's stated here that she had means. Most importantly, there are three things said of her here. And this is what's really important to us. She was a worshiper of God. Meaning, not just another Jew going through ritual. Well, I've done my nod to God thing. I took care of that. The idea is that she was a sincere seeker of the true and the living God, a seeker of truth. And we have to ask ourselves, everyone here, are you a seeker of truth? Are you willing just to settle for being religious or taking for granted a sort of humdrum state of churchiness? Or do you have that itch to know truth? that can only be satisfied in being in God's Word. Because this is where truth is found. Sanctify them in truth. Thy Word is truth. This is where the only way that can be found, that is the narrow way that leads to life, can be found, is in the Word of God. That's why we preach it. That's why we teach it. And we have no pride in that. In fact, we have just the opposite. In fact, the Bible exposes us for who we really are. But it points us to who can take care of all of the troubles of life and ultimately give us eternal life. Because the Bible is about Him. It's about Him. So she was a worshiper of God, meaning that she had, there's something more there than just going through the, 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 the routine and God had led Paul to come there and talk to her to bring her additional light that she might know Jesus Christ whom to know is eternal life. It says secondly that she was listening. She was listening. The implications are huge. And here's where it comes together. In fact, Holding your finger here, turn back again to John chapter 8. This is a big deal. Who listens and who doesn't listen? God has that in His hand, and we have to understand that. John 8, 43. Jesus is speaking again to these self-righteous individuals of His time, the same ones that had Him crucified. He says, why do you, verse 43, Why do you not understand what I'm saying? He's been... He's been instructing them no man spoke like Christ did of the truth he is the Messiah the very one they were supposedly looking for 
Why do you not understand what I'm saying? It's because you cannot hear my word. We know from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, I won't get you to turn there, that to the natural man, the man that will not really listen to God's word, he doesn't interest it in that. He, he says that he thinks it's a bunch of foolishness to him. Is it foolishness to you today? Well, I hope not. I, I don't think it is for most of you that are here. Then if it's not foolishness, we ought to be pursuing it with all our strength, with all our heart, with all our ability, with all our mind. We ought to be soaking it up like a sponge soaks up water. Because to know this word is to know Jesus. And to know Jesus is eternal life. And it's comfort and joy and peace that passes all understanding. Hallelujah. And so here she is listening and it shows us that God has worked there and she's willing to be influenced. And she knows truth from error. She has receptors. And it says the Lord opened her heart to respond. Now, there's nothing more important than that. And before I launch off into God's sovereignty and salvation which most of us at least embrace to some degree or other. Why are we interested in the things of God? Why are we willing to listen at all? John talks about very simply, we love. He's talking about there, we love God and we love the brethren. Why? Because he first loved us. <laughs> We are told in Scripture that we are dead in trespasses and sin. Ephesians chapter 2, you know that. And if we're dead, you don't see dead men doing much. I don't see them doing anything. That's the spiritual condition of mankind. Paul talks about in Romans 3 that there is none that seeks for God. No, not one that seeks for God. God has to invade our life. God has to make us alive. Why do we pray? Why do we rest upon Him? Why do we look to Him? Oh Lord, have mercy on my brother, on my father, on my sister, on my friend. Why do we do that? Because it is He that must open the heart. We can't save anybody. I can't save anybody. I, I, I try to convince people with all my heart since God got a hold of me. That's what Paul is trying to do here as well. Now, if salvation was initiated and completed by me, nobody would be saved. <laughs> it's not a matter of intellectualness even. It's a matter of God opening the heart. Otherwise, no one would be saved. The heart speaks of who a person really is. It's the seat of intellect and emotions and will. And the opening of the heart is something that is supernatural. That's what Christ was talking about to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, wasn't it? You must be born again. Now, who can make themselves born again? Nobody. You couldn't make yourself born the first time. That was a supernatural thing. To be born again is to be born spiritually with, from God because we were born dead in sins. And we need to be spiritually made anew. Or as Ezekiel 36, 26 says, and speaking of the new covenant, he takes out the heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. Wow. That's a heart transplant. I don't know how many of you, or if we have anybody here, I know we've had them here that have had heart transplants, but we're really talking about this is a real heart transplant. This is a spiritual heart. So note as well, she was a, a good religious person, this Lydia. Says she's a worshiper of God. But what does the scripture say? She was not born again until God opened her heart to the truth of Christ. Christ said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. 
People need Christ. Why are we to go out? Why are we to preach the gospel? Why are we presenting this word to individuals? It's because they need Christ. There's no other answer. There's no other means given among men, as Peter said, whereby we must be saved. And so, we look here and it says, she responded to the things spoken by Paul. And we are reminded, who is Paul? He's the extended spokesman of Jesus Christ. He's an apostle. He wrote much of the New Testament. Paul's words are what? They're Christ's words. His words are the Bible. And so today, what do we have? We don't have apostles walking around. We don't have that uh, special unction that was alive at that particular time because of the apostles. But we do have, preciously, the Word of God. And so I ask the question to myself and to you, does the Bible mean more to you than anything you can earthly possess? Should be. What would you do if you didn't have the Bible? You know, your house, even your clothes. We came naked into the world and we're going to leave naked. We leave with nothing. But you can take the Bible with you. <laughs> the Bible even itself, it says, grass withers and flower fades, but the Word of God abides forever. You're going to take that with you. Nothing more precious than the Word of God. So is it a dust collector? Is it being used to build you up in the faith, to encourage you, to comfort you, to know Jesus Christ, and to point others to Jesus Christ because this Word is the source of life, the only hope for any person. So the idea of Lydia responding to Paul means that she listened to what Paul communicated and knew it was the truth. And then it became to her the most important matter that she could ever have. And so it is with all of God's children. Everything else pales in immediate importance. It just does this other stuff just doesn't matter. And it says in verse 15, and when she and her household had been baptized, right there in the river, or at least some point there, we it could have been the next day or the day after. We don't know. It doesn't really matter. But it was pretty soon. We're not told the time frame. But implied is that it was either immediate or soon after. What does she say in this same sentence? She says, she urged us saying. Urged us. She's anxious. <laughs> Let's get this thing moving. You opened my heart. You opened my eyes. If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord. And that's the issue. That's the qualification, by the way, for baptism. Real change. A person sincerely faithful. And why baptized? What is Paul doing? The Great Commission. Going to all the world and preach the gospel. He doesn't end there, does he? Baptizing him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, lo, I'm with you always. Baptizing them, it's commanded. It's commanded. And what does it do? It proclaims our new identification with Jesus Christ. Who have we been identified with in our birth? Satan. We're born in trespasses and sin. We need a new heart. We need a new relationship. We need a new birth. Look at Romans 6 briefly, just for a moment. Romans chapter 6. Here's Paul again addressing the same thing. Romans 6, verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? What's he talking about there? Identification with Christ. I've been identified in my sin, without hope, lost in the world. Now I'm going to be identified with Jesus Christ and what He did on Calvary's cross <laughs> for sinners. There's nothing better than that. Nothing more wonderful, more special. 
And so we're seeing here this is symbolism that is necessary to show what's going on with us. He says in verse 4, Therefore, we have been buried with him, with who? Christ, and through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Our old self is to be dead. We put it to death. All my personal efforts... All my thoughts about how good and great I am, all of those ridiculous things that are worthless junk that Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 3, all that's dead. I want to walk in newness of life with the Savior, with Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, that's what I want to do. In fact, he says in verse 5, for if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. The likeness of his resurrection. And he says in verse 6, the, knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him. That's the identity. That's how connected, how close and how intertwining is this connection such that we illustrate it in the immersion in the water and to, to oldness, is, uh, our old self is died and we're raised again to new life. And he says in verse 10, we now live to God. We now live to God. That's the commitment it represents. And so it's displaying our faith, our gratitude, our love, and also our commitment moving forward. I'm different now. If a Christian's not different, he's not a Christian. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. And so, seeing people come to true faith in Christ should be our greatest desire and our delight. What else matters? What else matters? Now, Lydia here has a different attitude back in Acts 16. Where she says, if you've judged me faithful, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon them. What is she interested in now? <laughs> She's interested in God's people. She's interested in God's word. She wants to hear more <laughs> from the Apostle Paul. But she also wants to be with them. She wants to be in their presence. That's one of the purposes of us getting together as a people of the Lord. In the worship service and other times of all these opportunities of Bible study and everything else. Is to get together with God's people and interact about the things of God. That's where our interest should be. That doesn't mean we stop living outside with our jobs and school or whatever else is going on. I'm not talking about that. But boy, we ought to be running to church in the morning because that's where it's really happening. So this woman became the object of God's affection. And here it is, brethren, and we owe a debt of gratitude. This is now Europe. And this is the first convert in Europe. Can you imagine that? Europe. Now, they're, not, they're dead over there now, generally speaking. Just like we're getting quickly dead in America. But Europe was, became the light through the, the ages of the church. Uh, the centuries that were there, it became a light to the world to bring the gospel of truth. America was even founded, generally speaking, on Judeo-Christian values and on the things of the Word and the belief in the God of the Bible. Now, we've come a long way, baby. But God still has His people spread throughout this land. And we should be forever grateful at God's work. And it all started with this lady, Lydia. The Lord works in mysterious, mysterious ways. Let's, in closing, go to two quick places. Go to Mark chapter 30. Excuse me, Mark chapter 4. There is no Mark chapter 3. Please don't go there. Mark chapter 4, verse 30. 
here's, a, here's this parable of the mustard seed. And Jesus said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Now, sometimes we have to make that delineation by the context. He's talking about the kingdom of God being God's coming kingdom on earth that will be the literal rule of Jesus Christ on the earth. Come to Daniel tonight. And sometimes he's talking about God's work in the kingdom of God in drawing sinners to himself that will be those that he will have with him to rule with him when he does come in his kingdom literally on the earth. Okay? What does he say? He's talking here about the second one. God's work in drawing sinners. How shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds that are upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. Wow. Wow. It becomes something useful. It becomes a blessing. It started with nothing. It was so insignificant. You, you had to get your glasses adjusted and try to see it down there. It's a teeny weeny little thing. But it grows to this giant tree such that even the birds can come and rest in it. It's a place that could never have been anticipated by the world. And it started here with Lydia, and it becomes this refuge for the lost. It becomes this rescue for the sick. It becomes a refuge, like the refuge for the birds, for the sinners that want to come to Christ, that, ha that want to have hope and have true hope in Him, and He is true hope. Oh, how important that is. A place of beauty and shade and refuge. Look at 2 Thessalonians. In this context is the end times, the coming of Christ, and what Paul is encouraging those to do until he comes. In, ch in chapter 2 and verse 13, he says, in this context, he says, we should, But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord. Why? Because God has chosen you from the beginning. There it is. That's what we're studying. God moving in history, calling and finding His sheep and bringing them to Himself. Chosen you for the, from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this He called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. The but there in verse 13, it starts this, is for a change of attitude from the thinking of the world. Where do you get your change of attitude? You're going to get it in this word. You start just sucking up all the stuff that's going on around you. Have you ever seen or could you ever imagine how confused and wrong directed and troubled the world is around us? Up is down and left is right. And I mean, I've never seen anything like it. I heard some guy on the radio talking about morals. And he was talking about morals in the sense of immorals. Everything he said was immoral. Because we have no standard today. Because the standard is God's Word. It's what Jesus says, not what somebody makes up as they go along. Edition number 572. And so this difference, he says here. That's the difference of verse 14. He said, God has chosen you from the beginning. And therefore, he goes on to say, are you standing firm? Are you standing firm? Are you continuing in the things of God? Are you resting in Him? Are you reading His Word? Are you in His Word? Are you listening to good preachers and teachers? Are you taking in that which is uh, 
uplifting and edifying and beneficial and that points you to, to walk faithfully to the Lord? That's what you need to be doing. You want to be comforted? You want to have peace? You want to have joy that is beyond all the craziness that's going on otherwise? Look to God. Look to God. And then for those that are not his sheep or not yet his sheep, why aren't you his sheep? There's a strange mix when we're looking at the sovereignty of God. And we look at the things of God and recognize that all that the Father gives to me, John 6, 37, will come to me. But he who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Did you get that last part? All the Father gives me will come to me, but he that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Hmm, wait a minute. Have you come to him? Have you come to him? Are you trying to listen like Lydia was listening? Oh, there's nothing more desperate than this. All that's around you is blackness and no hope. There is hope in Christ. All hope in Jesus Christ. Are you listening to His Word? Is God opening your heart? Are you responding by faith? Are you seeking Him to know Him? Nothing better than that. Nothing more needful than that. I plead. I beseech you. Be reconciled to God. Let's bow in prayer, please. Father, we thank you for this portion of your holy and precious word. Indeed, oh, how wonderful it is, how cleansing, how joyful. Father, help us to take it to heart. God, help us to honor you and the things that we do. And Father, anyone within the sound of my voice, I pray thee, if they're hearing these things for the first time or they're, oh, I pray that you might work in their heart and that you would expose them to this truth and help them, Father, to change their direction, embrace you, repent of their sins, and by faith, follow the Lord Jesus. We beseech you and we ask you, Father, to edify your people and bless this time together. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.